Good morning, folks. Uh, let's go ahead and take a seat as Dave Bowman comes on up to help us open up this morning. And um, let's welcome him as he comes on up. Good morning, people of the Lord. Ah, so glad to see folks coming in this morning. And you know, we watched a lot of folks running by the house today and doing their various activities. And my thought was, this is... This is the Lord's day. This is a day for us to gather in his house. Let me get this. Okay. I've heard a word recently that caught my attention. It describes the action of someone or something being taken captive against their will without any remedy for the situation. It is much like that when Satan deceived God's children in the garden. And he held them and all future generations in sin against their will, powerless to free themselves. It brought to mind a song in our hymn book, and so that you can take advantage of it today, you might want to take a hymn book out. And it's number 178. To understand that word, this song, oh, did I tell you what the word is? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, if you'll notice, the very next to the last word, or words in the last verse, talks about a ransom. For those of you who like to work with technology, you're familiar with the word ransomware. Being taken captive without a remedy. Or those who have found themselves traveling in foreign countries being taken captive without a remedy. And there's the demand for a ransom. So I want us to sing together this morning this song, 178. Tell me the story of Jesus. Someone paid the ransom. Amen? Stand with me as we sing. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrows he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell of the 
story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. That story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard heavenly father we're so grateful that we can gather in this sanctuary and we can hear of your love we can bring you our love. You paid the ransom for us, Lord. You owed a debt. You paid a debt that you did not owe. I owed a debt that I could not pay. I thank you this morning, Lord, for your redemption. Draw us close to your heart today. May this sanctuary truly be a place set apart where we meet with you. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen.
Let's read together. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. God bless his word to your hearts. You may be seated. You can leave those verses up there, Nathaniel, if you'd like. I'll refer to them. We've been going through a series, when I have been preaching here, on a thematic series on the kingdom rising. And uh, though not everyone is here each time that I'm presenting one of these, I, I want to just highlight a couple of reasons why. I, I sense that there are many of us that struggle with the way news is reported. Am I in the right place? All right. And I mean this, if you're wondering, well, what is he talking about? News is reported. I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, how truthful or inaccurate some of the news is, but here's the key. That's all well and good. I mean, that's true, but here's the point. Today, we have a very, very strong trend that whenever we speak about what is going on, we emphasize the evil, emphasize the darkness, and emphasize the growing hopelessness in the world today. And the reason that I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me to use the parables of Matthew 13 as an illustration of how God's ways in the kingdom work and his kingdom rises. Darkness comes in from the top. It's in people's hearts, but we start noticing it when it comes in through overregulation and globalism and, and all these kinds of things. And, and we begin to think, oh my gosh, the whole world is, everything is closing in. Never quite seen it this way. But what we need to see is the kingdom coming up in the hearts of people. And first of all, I was just talking to someone about this and, and the person took to me and said, but how can you have, I can't see what you're talking about. And that's what we need to ask God for. Give us the sight to see what you're doing. Christians are going to need in these days to have a kingdom lens. The kingdom lens is we see Christ, we don't work to see Antichrist. It, the Antichrist spirit is in every generation. It's not that it doesn't exist. But it's the spirit of Christ and the light of the kingdom that will expose that darkness. The darkness doesn't rule. Christ rules. And the more we look at this, we realize then why is God letting, that's the right phrase, why does God let darkness manifest? Now that's an important question to ask. That's an important way to say it. It is not the darkness. Someone had, uh, said to me, they just offered a Christian talking to me about this, and, and they simply said this. This is absolutely amazing that the darkness is receding enough for us to see some light. Thinking, no, it's God that allows some darkness to rule to get our attention. If everything goes well and there are no problems and everything is sweet, we wander from God. There's a hymn about that. I'm prone to wander. And I realize it. And if you say, oh, not me, I'm never prone to wander, you're a fool. Because you and I know when things go right, when things are, 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 are good, it doesn't mean now the level of tragedy you've experienced shows you how far off you've been. We don't go counting things that way. It's God's sovereignty. So we've emphasized several things. We've emphasized this, that what we're saved to is greater than what we've been saved from. It's great to give our testimony. It's wonderful. I look forward to the gentleman's testimony. I almost pointed to, I didn't, I'm, I'm being obedient. But I, I look forward to people's testimony because we get delivered from darkness and it's hope that it can happen. There's a way out. It's Christ, that's true. But we realize this, what we're saved to 
is bigger than what we've been saved from. So we don't just emphasize the testimony and what we've been saved from, we start emphasizing what we're saved to. That's exciting. Also underlying this is God is preparing His bride, His ecclesia. Now we use the word ecclesia, it's a Greek word for the church used in the New Testament, and it means the government of the church. Which now we don't talk about local government, how we operate here as a local church. The government of a church means what the church does, it influences society because it is an ecclesia. The word ecclesia is the word that was used by the Greeks for their government once they started to decentralize it. When they started to decentralize it, and the great lawgiver from Greece, Salon, had traveled the world looking for a better system of government than centralized tyranny. How about that? He was not a believer. But we know by evidence that he went into uh, Babylon seeking an audience to learn of government, and we can be fairly certain he met with a man by the name of Daniel who showed him the kingdom's government, which is completely opposite. It's not a palace with a king, and, that, and, and therefore the further you live away from that palace, the further you live away from your rights and all the privileges. No, it is the kingdom of God is the most unique kingdom in all the earth because the king came and died and by the power of the Spirit lives in his subjects. There is no other kingdom like that. Kings love privileges. Kings love royalty. Kings love power. And I'm giving this introduction because that's what ornates this parable. Because the only people in Jesus' day that had pearls were kings. They were in Roman Caesar palaces. Nobody owned a pearl. No common person owned a pearl. They would literally have to sell the whole neighborhood to get a pearl. You'd have to sell everything you own and you still wouldn't have enough to buy a pearl. The price was extravagant. And everybody's minds were, it was royalty. You see, royalty smacks of egotism, elitism. We know what you don't know. We are, we're going to do things you just don't, it's going to be for your good. But I can't tell you what it is because I, you know, there's a few of us that meet certain parts of the world on a regular basis and we're going to determine what's best for all of you peons on what, what would be good for you. See, that's egotism. That is elitism. That is the idea of royalty. The idea of royalty is I'm special because of who my parents were. I'm special because of the royal line. I'm special with this. It, it smacks of this uh, of egotistical pride. And God wants his believers in his kingdom in this day to smell that when you see it. To realize, not to reject the person that's caught up in it. God will, can reach anyone, but to smell it on you. And we and, and me, and we realize, no, Lord, you're moving from the bottom up. You're moving, moving from where people say there's no hope. This is the thing that excites me. Knowing history, it excites me that it has been many times in history where the people at the top who think they have everything under control, they always miss one person called God. And they think they're God. And at the worst time for them, best time for us, he intervenes and all of a sudden says, hello, I'm still here and I'm the one that's been allowing you to appear to win, to wake up my people and to wake up my saints who live in the power of God. And though they don't know it, they're treading on scorpions and all the power of the enemy every step they take in Jesus Christ. And therefore, my kingdom wins. Darkness loses. It's only a matter of time. So... Pray that we hang around long enough to see the big victory party. But you see, this is why we say God is preparing the ecclesia for victory over the gates of hell. 
I'm not looking for Antichrist. If there's going to be a rise of the Antichrist spirit, it wouldn't shock me. But I'm looking for what Jesus is doing, what God is doing in his kingdom. And I want to focus on that. I want to see that. I don't want to miss that. Anybody want to agree with that? I want to see that happening. And I want to be in hope and not fear. But the fear of God, for sure. And we've been talking about this, that God is going to shake and expose evil as his kingdom rises. So don't be shocked by more and more evil being paraded on the news and other places. Arrogance and the things that wouldn't have been said 20 years ago, I don't think I would have ever heard that out of, it would have been done back rooms, but not right out front. And it's amazing when you see that happen and say, okay, God, you're dealing with this. Don't fall for the lie that God is so weak he couldn't stop that person from talking. Now, that's not true. God is allowing it for their own sake because some of the people that I'm reading about that are talking like this, they're even shocked about how they're talking and they're scared by what they're planning to do. Knowing people that are in the inner circle who are Christians, God has them everywhere, folks. Just one I heard, on, I was on a call with them. He simply said this, at the highest levels, and I'm not going to mention where it is. He said, this is the amazing thing. The Holy Spirit's giving me discernment, and I'm in the meeting, and I'm in the group. And all of a sudden, they realize they're in a place they've never been before. They don't know what they're doing, and they're starting to wring their hands. What if we do something when we can't get out of this? In other words, there's fear in the enemy's camp itself. And he's just sitting there and he says, it was not a time for me to speak. I said, yeah, make sure it is the right time to say something. So we've talked about the fact that God is going to dethrone a love of wealth, pleasure, and power in our hearts. God is going to rehearse key biblical thought patterns in our minds so we discern truth from error. God is working with us, learning to share the gospel through our own parable, our own stories. Lord, help me tell my story of how I came to know you simply with people. More and more opportunities are coming your way. We discern the kingdom and its balance because it has both new, fresh ideas and old, rehearsed, classical ideas. Don't get stuck in one or the other extreme. It's a combination of both. And God is there because God's truth is fresh today and it's classic, it never grows old. But it's old to us. We recognize that in the midst of darkness we want to see the light of the hidden treasure of God's kingdom. Because God's kingdom, as we talked to two weeks ago, is like leaven. And like relationships are built in the very underneath part of, uh, of leaven when leaven, leaven's a loaf. Loaf, it comes internally and the particles begin to be joined. This is like relationships. Build relationships with your neighbors. Build relationships with public officials. Build relationships all around the place. Christian or not Christian, be simply, be Christ. You don't have to always talk. Hello, did you hear that? <laughs> you can just be an example, a good worker. Look, if you're a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, 22-year-old, you work diligently to bless your boss. You work to make him rich. And you work to do that blessing. We tell you right now, you'll be the last person fired. They're not going to fire someone who works like that. And you say, yeah, but it's getting so bad out there. It's getting so bad out there. The Christian who simply works shines like, wong, 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 wong. I mean, I've had bosses come to me when students from our school or some other place, and they say, don't they go to your church? And I don't know, I don't know what to say sometimes. I, no, I've never heard of them. <laughs> no, I say, yes. And they go, where do you grow them? I could use 10 more of them. Because, because, not because they're wonderful and talented. They show up on time. And simply work. Folks, it's the simple things. We're not going to be the wonderful things. I got a shiny sword and watch out what you say around me. No. I just, you know, stay in your lane. Drive. Be a nice, and be friendly. And smile. And say to the boss, listen, I'll tell you right now. If you went to a boss, I don't care if you work at McDonald's, if you work at Friendly's, well, that's going out of business. Well, no, it's not all. But wherever you work. If you went to the boss one time and said, look, 
I was just praying for you this morning. I really pray that you become productive and that all your needs are met. Get ready for the stretcher. Because I can guarantee you right now, not many workers say that to bosses. But we should. The ones who should be are believers. Or it's the boss, if you're the believer with the boss, then you're the one that compliments your workers. Because God wants family businesses, not just natural families, but all um, employer and employee has a family. It's a lie from the pit of hell picked up by Marxism that there always has to be a war between the owner and the workers. That's a lie, folks. It's not true. All right. I guess I, guess I should preach the message. No charge for the introduction. So here we have two small verses. Jesus is inside the house now. He's not out teaching in public. He's out teaching in private. And not because it's just inside. Usually it was Peter's house when he was in Capernaum. But it was, it, it was a, a house large enough to get the disciples in there. And they're in. Because remember, uh, about uh, several of the past, more than a majority of these parables are spoken of in the house. So we don't have the a translation or interpretation because they probably discussed it afterwards and Matthew stopped writing it down or whatever. The point is, this was inside. This is an inside job. This is something for the church to consider, the church to understand. Doesn't mean it shouldn't go public. It simply means it's a powerful story about fishing. Now, they all understood this. Let's just get a couple of facts correct. The same way pearls are formed today in saltwater oysters or freshwater mussels, the way they were made in Jesus' day. And I want you to think and listen to me now. These creatures that live down in the mud, that are unnoticed, not caught with the normal fishing methods, you, don't, you, you can by accident do it even today. You can pull up mussels, you can pull up oysters by accident, but... Back in Jesus' day, they're stuck down there. It takes a lot of work to get them out. It's going to take a lot of work to even find out where they are. That's a mysterious type of thing. But they all knew about it. And they, they didn't know at the time in Jesus' day what we know today scientifically about how these pearls are formed. And they're formed because of this. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully now. When uh, any of those shelled creatures of God the shell comes apart just a tiny bit. Some kind of parasite, stone, or irritant gets inside the shell. No irritant, no pearl. Now let me say that again. Because you need to get it spiritually, you can't just get it naturally. No irritation, no pearl. Lord! Make me like you. Ah, oh, that makes me furious. I can't stand that. I mean, you asked. If you don't get an irritant, because the, the pearl is Christ. There's only one pearl in all the universe that has the greatest value, the one great pearl that you're going to seek that once you find that, you don't go fishing for pearls anymore. you got the only one, and it's worth more than the whole universe. So we know who the pearl is. Well, you want that formed inside of you? Welcome irritations. In fact, this is what the, this is what the oyster and the mussel does by instinct. I probably aren't consciously thinking about it. The stone, the parasite gets in there. And automatically, they begin working to defend themselves from the inner irritant. Not to push it out to say, I reject all trials and tribulations in Jesus' name. I'm a king's kid, and I will not go through anything difficult. No. That's, that's ridiculous, not even good theology. What we're talking here is something comes in, and you say, okay, there's an irritant in my life. What these creatures do is they begin to secrete inside themselves a coating to go over that irritant and keep it over and over and over and get it smoother and smoother so that it no longer stops their normal function. But the irritant has produced something valuable in them that they wouldn't have had unless the irritant entered. 
And because we're sinners, we have plenty of holes in our shells. What do you think? Amen. Because of sin, I get irritated. There, I just said it. Occasionally irritated. Hopefully it's less amount per week now than it was 10 years ago. But there are days. I don't know, have you ever had a day where everything irritates you? It's like, I'm on a roll. It's like, it's not good. I'm on a roll. But if I'm thinking properly, I'm saying, okay, let's secrete. Holy Spirit, can you help me with this? I don't like the irritant. I don't want it in my life. Okay, okay, so I can't cast out the old nature. That comes in heaven. Okay, fine. So now what I'm going to have to be doing is, let me just cover it. Love covers a multitude of sin. That's one way you can start covering it. Um, the grace of God comes in. Lord, would you help me in dealing with this? Why are you letting this in me to wake me up to something that entered into my life that's not supposed to be stopping my normal life's work? So therefore, Lord, let it cover it. And then it covers it. And the layer covers it. And there are scientific names for all of these. And I was rereading them this week. And, but here's the point. It gets to the place where the covering over the irritant has come to be known as mother of the pearl. Mother of pearl is a, a scientific description of something uh, pure that goes over that and becomes pure and smooth and, and very, very, um, uh, you know, into a place of... Uh, Value, to such a valuable degree. So we were talking about irritants in our life. We were talking about issues that come into our life that get under our shell. We always used to say, we always say under our skin, right? When just meaning that we um, have a problem with that. Now I want to just describe one other aspect in Jesus' day. If someone was going to get pearls, they would have to dive down 45 yards into the deepest parts of the sea. Uh, and sometimes it, it's deeper than and the pressure. You know, the pressure and the sea gets the, very much there. They're taking a risk to their life. They don't have the equipment that we have today. And then they have to go down and find those pearls. So it's very expensive to get them. And then once they do have them, they have to uh, be very careful because if you're caught with a... Because the pearls were in the crown jewels. Per, pearls were in the, in the palaces. They were uh, among the Caesars among those that had power and wealth. And the disparity between the people who were the elitist and the people who were the common people was very large. And because of that situation, Jesus saying this, he's saying, here's someone who is going to get a goodly pearl, someone who is seeking a pearl. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Now, first of all, how rare that was in Jesus' day. Someone who's seeking it. It's rare today. We would say this. The kingdom of God is like a believer with kingdom consciousness in their life seeking the pearl of great price. I'm seeking Christ's covering for my irritants so that I become more valuable in His sight in the kingdom because His nature is formed in me. I am going after the one pearl. I've learned to discern and go through the marketplace. You're a merchant and you go in. When you go through a marketplace, you see the things you don't want, you see the things you want. Even today, though today with our modern methods, pearls are not as high valuable uh, in, in the contrast as they were then because of the way we can get them. We can get them much quicker. We can get them, uh, we can mass produce pearls. But still, there are people attracted to jewelry stores, attracted to the things that appear to have great wealth, and you discard the others. Now listen, this is what he's saying. It's a merchant. The kingdom is like a merchant individual. That means Every day we really go shopping. Even you. You go shopping. What are you shopping? You're comparing and contrasting. So I hear a news report. I hear something going on. I have to ask myself a question. Is this worth a lot of investment of my time? Is this worth a ton of emphasis in my life right now? Is this, sometimes, oh yes, I need to know that exists. I need to know those things. I will research it. I will deal with it. But the thing that I'm seeking is not to know more about darkness. The thing that I'm seeking is that Christ's life would come and rise within me in a greater way. I'm seeking to say, to handle irritants in a better way. I'm seeking to handle the things that come 
that throw me a curveball. Some are massive. Some are small. But whatever they are, Lord Jesus, help me to be able to focus on those things. Because remember, it's one seeking beautiful pearls. We seek the nature of Christ to come forth in our life. We seek the Holy Spirit's power to come and is made perfect in our weakness, our consciousness of our weakness. We're always weak, but we aren't conscious of that, how weak we are in and of ourselves. So Lord, help me seek the beautiful pearls. And go to the next verse and look at this. In verse 46... If we see this now, I want to come to dealing with, all right, then what do we do? When he had found the one pearl of greatest price, he went and what? Sold all that he had. Now that's a phrase that simply means this. I am going to sell off making my irritants the number one part of my life. I'm going to sell off my complaint. I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe what they just said on television. I can't believe on the news, but I got to go back and hear more because I'm just, I got to see if it's worse than it was before. Targeted, selective, Holy Spirit driven research is good. Obsession is not good. I know I'm called to study it, but I'm not called to obsess over it. I'm not called to get so steeped in it that I, I begin to think, oh my gosh, the darkness is winning. I'm human like you are. No, I've got to then say, Lord, I'm going to seek this and I want to sell all those other detours. I want to sell those off in order to get Christ's nature. It is a, there's a buying and a selling. That's what, a, that's what merchant is. That's what economics is. When we sell, when we say die to self, say no to your sin nature, say no to the negative thoughts, say no to those things that are going on, you're selling it. I sell that off. Devil, you love it, go buy it. But I don't want to buy it. I want to buy the things that are powerful, the things that are going to now uh, become more and more a part of my nature, a part of Christ. Now here's the situation. Today, why is Jesus Christ the pearl of great price? We're called to seek first the kingdom because Jesus is the pearl of God. The Bible says that the Christians are like jewels in God's throne. We are the jewels now. And Christ is the jewel of God. And His nature, and by coming in His nature, He has shows us what that is. For instance, here's some illustrations. Today, it is very, very clear that we are a culture that's lost our identity. And the culture has lost its identity because individuals don't know who they are anymore. Can you imagine people raised and never hear that there's a creator? Never hear that they're made in the image of God. Never hear that though they're marred by sin, they have a purpose. They were born for such a time as this. They were in there. Why? Because you see, Jesus Christ himself is the Alpha and the Omega. The creator and the purpose. Not just you were created in the image of God. That's wonderful. God might have a destiny for your life. No, he's the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And he's everything in between. Jesus Christ is the solution. He is the great pearl. He will solve the identity crisis we have in our culture. If a revelation can come, he's the beginning and he's the end. And he knows the end from the beginning. And this is who he is. Notice we've got issues today. We are desperate. We want a sovereign intervention of God. More and more people come to him. Where's God? When's he going to intervene? When's he going to do this? When's he going to come and deal with it? Well, we got a word up here called Jehovah. Jehovah is the, now remember, this is the way you'd say it. You'd say he's the Jehovah, the El Shaddai, El Roy, but he's Jehovah Sitkanu, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Yeshua. He is, Jehovah means the fullness of God himself. And, and the Bible tells us clearly, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes, Jesus Christ, the sum of God and who he is, he's sovereign. And when you realize that Jesus Christ is my sovereign, I know he will intervene. I don't know when he's sovereign. That's what sovereign means. I'm not in control. He's in control. So yield up the control. Yield up the obsession. Yield up the anxiety and say, ah, my Lord is Jehovah. 
And he has everything under control. Not only that, we're lost, we're without hope, we're separate from God. Because of sin, there's a lostness in our culture, in the souls of men. They're saying we're desperate, we don't know what to do. Well, there's a word for that too, and that word is Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the savior. He's the deliverer. He's the, he's the one who came on our behalf. Representing God, dying in our place. He's the propitiation for our sins. I know you love that word. Okay, he is the one who is taking our place. That's cool. You can say, look, I'm a mess today, Lord. Messiah should come to your mind. Lord, you are Messiah. You are the one that is the greatest one that will substitute. Lord, would you take over in my situation because I'm not doing a good job. Lord, I'm going crazy here. I want to fix this, fix that. You know, 99% of everything I research, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Nobody calls me for advice. But I'm saying, I can't do anything about it. Ask my wife. I have opinions. I have ideas. But that's okay. Because there's someone I know. And he knows both the timing and the area to deal with it. So if you're without hope, you have a Messiah. We're in need of a deliverer who knows our weakness. That's why, see, he's called the Son of God and the Son of Man. He's the deliverer from God, but he's also the Son of Man. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your weakness. Due to sin, our inability to reach God, we need someone perfect. That's the Son of God. Like we have the Son of Man. Then who will bridge us and bridge the gap? Who can bring peace before the anger and wrath of God on our sin and the holiness of God? He's the Prince of And this Prince of Peace, this Prince of... We couldn't fit everything up there. But the Prince of Peace is Jehovah. He's Jehovah Jireh. He is the Messiah. It is Christ that is our focus, not the enemy. And I'll close with this. If you, if you look at all the names that we have here, you could sum up all of these things. The nations of the world are in turmoil. The leaders do not know what to do. God has allowed the very unrighteous, sinful, man-centered, not referring to God, quote, solutions to all our community's problems. And what's happening is they're collapsing. You can't live and reject God and not have a society collapse in upon itself. It's happening everywhere. And just keep, God made it that way. You reject God, you're going to pay the consequences. And people are paying those consequences. Our hearts go out for the innocent individuals who have to go through so much more than many of us have to go through. But here's the point. Then what's, good, what's to happen? Do you see Christ, according to Psalm 2, and Revelation 1 and 2, is the inheritor of the nations. He is the king of kings. King, small k, of kings, uh, large k, of small k's. He is the head. People don't know it. Can you imagine in, in the national palaces of the world today, people getting together, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? Oh my God, we told everybody that government was the solution to their problems, and now they're coming to us. They want us to pay their rent. They want us to pay everything. They want, we can't do it. It's impossible to have the resources to go. Government isn't God. It's going to run out of resources. It's going to run out of ability. It can't do it. So therefore, now, how do we tell them? What do we do? I'm not making this up. There are people who are asking, what do we do? If we go tell the people, we don't have the money, we can't do what we promised, they'll take to the streets. The, the place will go absolutely berserk. But what do we say? So we try to say nothing. Just have a nice day or, or something else. Folks, that's why he's the king of kings. That's why he's the Lord of lords. That's why when we go to Jesus Christ, he does have a solution. The Bible does have an answer. One of these days, the revelations will come, even in America as it's coming around the world. Look to the Bible. Look at the ancient paths where you once walked. Look to the place where it gave the biblical principles with how to run a nation, how to run an economy, how to run a civil government. Government is not God. God is government. So uh, God, is, uh, God is the ruler, so government must be limited. It can't be sovereign. You can't have God sovereign and government as sovereign. It's got to be one or the other, and people have run off on one direction that government is sovereign. I've got news for you, folks. It's going to be good news. There's coming a day soon. People are waking up and saying, well, if it's not government, 
What is it? It is someone called Elohim, creator of the universe. Adonai, our personal God. El Roy, El Shaddai. Jehovah, Jehovah, our righteousness, Sitkanu. Jehovah Jireh, the one who supplies our needs. The Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Jehovah Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Jehovah Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah. He is Father, Son, Spirit of God, Emmanuel with us. Jesus Christ, Redeemer, Bread of Life, Alpha and Omega. Come on up. Hallelujah. Just in case you didn't get the message, it's going to be sung. That's my brother, by the way. And I just want to also remind you, this is whose team we're on. If you catch it, sing along with us. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He shall dwell within them, and they shall be his people. And Almighty God will be with them. shall wipe away all tears from their eyes there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying hallelujah and no more pain the former things are all passed away he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new. He said to me, Write these words, for they are faithful and true. It is done. It is done. beginning and the end the son of god the king of kings lord of lords he's everything messiah jehovah the prince of peace is he the son of man seed of abraham second person in the trinity he is the alpha and omega the beginning and the end the son of god the King of kings, Lord of lords, he is everything. Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is he. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Son of God, the King of kings. The Lord of Lords, He's everything. Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is He. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, He's everything. Messiah, Jehovah. The Prince of Peace is He, the Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity. He is the Alpha and Omega, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Messiah, Jehovah, the Christian. Abraham. He is the Alpha 
and Omega, the beginning and the end, Son of God, King of kings, the Lord. Hallelujah. Thinking about he's everything. That's why it's worth selling off all the other detours. There'll be those here to pray for you. If you need prayer of any kind, there'll be those up at the altar. Come to you right now. We thank you, Lord, that you are the healer. We ask you, Lord, give us the grace today, this week, that as we go through it, irritants will come our way. Help us, Lord, to see your purpose in that and to know that your kingdom is rising and the greatest value is you in the hearts of people, whoever they are, wherever they come from, whatever race, whatever economic strata, we thank you, God, that you are the one of greatest value. And may the tinsel and the elitism come crashing down by as you expose darkness. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord.